Have you heard about a diamond star that could put all the riches on Earth to shame? Or how about twinkling stars with surfaces made of solid iron? So let's take a look at these weird stars and try to unravel their mysteries. There's a star in the Centaurus constellation that was nicknamed Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yes, it was named after a Beatles song, because it basically is a Beatles song. You see, the star was discovered to have a massive diamond at its core. Now, you may be wondering how big this diamond really is. Well, it's estimated to be about 10 billion trillion trillion carats. That's a one followed by 34 zeros. To put that into perspective, the Hope Diamond, which is one of the largest diamonds on Earth, is a measly 45.5 carats in comparison. Can you imagine the size of the ring you could make with this star diamond? And it's about the same mass as our sun. But don't get too excited about the prospect of owning this diamond just yet. Even if you were Jeff Bezos, you wouldn't be able to afford it. According to Ronald Winston, CEO of Harry Winston Inc., the diamond is so big that it would likely depress the value of the market. So you'd have to settle for a much smaller diamond engagement ring. One interesting thing about the Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds star is that it's incredibly dense. In fact, it has the mass of the sun crammed into an object only a third the diameter of Earth. That's like trying to fit an elephant into a shoebox. And yet, despite its massive size, it's actually quite cool, with a core temperature of only about 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, the core temperature of our sun is about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Since the discovery of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, several other crystallized stars have been found, some with diamond hearts the size of Earth. It just goes to show that the universe is full of surprises, and you never know what kind of treasures you might find out there in the vast expanse of space. And this isn't the only weird star we've discovered so far. There are many strange, unexplained things in outer space. For example, let's take Vega. Vega, also known as Alpha Lyrae, is a bright star located in the constellation Lyra. It's one of the brightest stars in the night sky and is easily visible to the naked eye from most parts of the world. Now, Vega may look like a beautiful, bright star to us Northern Hemisphere folks, but little do we know, it's hiding a secret. It's actually quite squashed. You see, Vega's high spin rate causes it to bulge at the equator, kind of like a cosmic belly. It rotates once every 12.5 hours, which is pretty fast for a star, and it throws material out around its waistline. It's almost like the star is hula hooping. This material is further from the center of the star, so it experiences less gravity, causing it to cool and darken, leading to a gravity darkening effect. So Vega is basically a cosmic fitness guru's worst nightmare. Although for us stargazers, it still looks round because we're looking at it from Earth's pole end. However, if we saw it from a different angle, we'd get a very different view. One that might make us wonder if Vega has been sneaking some cosmic donuts behind our backs. But while we might joke about its equatorial waistline, there's no denying that Vega is still one of the brightest and most fascinating stars in our galaxy. But if you want something actually bright, then how about a supernova? Supernovas are giant space booms that occur when stars reach the end of their life cycle. It's like the grand finale of a fireworks show, but on a cosmic scale. They release more energy in a few seconds than our sun will produce in its entire lifetime. And this is exactly what happened to the next star of our show. This celestial object with a weird name, IPFT14HLS. But there's a catch. It isn't your average supernova. Even though this star made a blast in 2014 and started to fade away like usual, 
recently, it made an unexpected comeback and brightened once more. <laughs> Talk about a dramatic entrance. And if that wasn't enough, this thing continued to fade and brighten at least five times in total, which is a bit like a yo-yo. It's like the star just couldn't make up its mind about whether it wanted to stay bright or fade away into the abyss. Also, when scientists measured the supernova's spectrum, they found that it was evolving 10 times slower than other stars. Maybe it's a supernova that just wants to enjoy its golden years. All in all, this object is a real mystery. But this is not the only star suffering from the 2-in-1 syndrome. At first glance, M.Y. Camelopardalis appears to be a fairly common star. But after a closer look, astronomers concluded it was actually two stars in one. These two stars are orbiting each other at over 600,000 miles per hour. It's a contact binary star system, which means that the stars are so close together that they share a common envelope. In other words, they're so close to each other that they're practically smooching. These celestial Romeo and Juliet are one of the most massive known binary stars out there. Each of them individually weighs in at a whopping 32 and 38 solar masses, respectively. Astronomers also think that they might be on the brink of a stellar merger, which means that one day, they might just combine into one giant superstar. Wow, who knew space could be so romantic? Next, introducing another long name, HD 140283, also known as Methuselah's star. This little guy in the constellation Libra has been around for a while, and by a while, I mean a really long time. Actually, scientists used to think it was older than the universe itself. Just imagine if it turned out to be true. But eventually, they figured out that it's actually around 14.8 billion years old, a peer of our universe. That's still pretty impressive, though. This star is so old, it remembers when the Milky Way was just a baby galaxy. But despite all that, this star still has some life left in it. It's just starting to expand into a red giant, which is kind of like when you hit your 30s. Talk about aging well. But if all these things are somewhat comprehensible, then how about a star that was literally named WTF star by scientists? No, I'm not kidding. At least it used to be. Now it's called Tabby's star. It also has a more scientific name, but that one is a bit of a mouthful. But what's really bizarre about this star is its irregular dimming. For some reason, it doesn't glow like a normal star, but blinks, as if someone turned on and off a flashlight. And it's not just a little dip, we're talking up to a 22% drop in light. So it's not because it sometimes gets blocked by a planet or something. Scientists have come up with all sorts of explanations for this strange behavior, from comets to dust to even an extraterrestrial megastructure. That's right, but before your imagination runs too wild, it's important to note that the most likely explanation is just plain old dust. Perhaps the star is surrounded by some kind of dust cloud, and sometimes it prevents us from seeing it clearly. Although this explanation is still not 100% confirmed, there are still plenty of mysteries surrounding Tabby's star. One thing's for sure, it may be a bit of an oddball, but that's what makes it so fascinating. So, there you have it, folks. We're left in awe of the incredible diversity and strangeness of the cosmos. There's so much more to discover out there. So, let's keep exploring and keep being amazed by the wonders of the So check this out. Astronomers have discovered an exoplanet they're calling Super Saturn. It's got rings over an AU wide. An AU is the astronomical unit, the distance between the Sun to the Earth. That's an incredibly huge ring system, hence its name. 
Super Saturn is being called Mamajek's object after the astronomer who led the team to whom we owe the discovery. Professor Eric Mamajek of Rochester University in New York found Super Saturn while scouring through data downloaded from wide-angle transit observations. WASP is the acronym for Wide Angle Search for Exoplanets. It's an ingenious project developed in the year 2000 by astronomers at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and St. Andrews University in Scotland. Using four telescopes, the CCD video cameras on the scopes record the slight dimming of starlight caused by objects passing in front of stars. This is called the transit method of exoplanet detection. So, for example, the planet Venus transits across our view of the Sun every couple hundred years. A black dot, the silhouette of Venus, is visible, crossing in front of the Sun as Venus passes between our line of sight and the Sun. This tiny eclipse causes the amount of sunlight coming to Earth to be reduced by a minuscule amount, also known as teeny tiny. The same is true for all the stars in the Milky Way that have planets going around them. Exoplanetary transits in front of stars must be in direct line of sight with Earth for the starlight to be dim. Such transits do not occur very often. That's why thousands of stars must be looked at simultaneously for as long of a duration as possible, between 4 and 8 hours a night. WASP was created to stare continuously at as wide of a range of stars as possible. Maybe one of them would show an exoplanet transit. That translates into a lot of data being produced, about 40 gigabytes per viewing session. Computer scientists at Leicester University in England developed a computer program to store the data and generate photometric graphs of the light intensity of each star. Open University, also in England, joined the WASP project, took this data, and made it available for research by astronomers worldwide. The graphs of the intensity of starlight show that changes in its brightness are called light curves. These graphs have two axes. One is in the timeline axis, the other one is the intensity of light. As the object, considered an exoplanet, though it could also be a brown dwarf star, crosses in front of the star, the timeline axis keeps track of how swiftly it is moving. It tells us how close the object is to the star, while the brightness axis keeps track of how much the starlight dims. This way, we can find out how large the object is. Now, obviously, big objects will dim the light more and be easier to detect. At present, Earth-based equipment is not sensitive enough to measure the dimming caused by planets as small as Earth. Neptune's size and larger ones are the limit for WASP. However, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now in operation, has a much greater sensitivity and will be able to resolve the transits of Earth-sized exoplanets. Now, I know you want me to get to Super Saturn, but there's something else you should be familiar with before we get there. If the exoplanet has an atmosphere, or in the case of Super Saturn, a ring system, the starlight from the star the planet is transiting will shine through the atmosphere or ring system, and that can be detected too. The light curve will show less dimming in the photometric data, because not all the starlight is being blocked. Some light is still getting through the atmosphere or rings. This is important because it gives astronomers a reading of the atmosphere. The James Webb Space Telescope is fitted with spectroscopes that can determine the gas content of the transiting exoplanet atmospheres – oxygen, methane, carbon, etc. The WASP project has been really catching on. There's a Super WASP project now consisting of WASP North and a WASP South. One looks at the sky above the Northern Hemisphere, the other looks at the sky above the Southern Hemisphere. There's also a Next Generation Transit Survey, NGTS, based on the WASP project. It's automated, so astronomers don't have to stay up all night sipping coffee, but they can if they want to. Located at the European Southern Observatory in the Atacama Desert in Chile, the NGTS scans millions of stars and has discovered over a hundred exoplanets down to a size as small as three times the size of Earth. NGTS has started a Planet Hunters Club on social media. Citizen scientists can search the online database of light curves and perhaps discover your very own exoplanet. What had been a strictly British effort, started by one or two astronomers, is now a worldwide phenomenon. 
With the ability to read the spectroscopic signatures of atmospheric gases during exoplanet transits, a new idea emerged – techno-signatures. That is specifically identifying gases in exoplanet atmospheres that are produced by civilizations. The James Webb Space Telescope can do this. Gases from pollution, such as chlorofluorocarbon CFCs, can be seen spectroscopically if present. Tritium from fusion reactions, if they have them, can also be detected, along with heat patterns from cities on the planet's surfaces. Technosignatures is a recent concept that originated after the WASP project started. Who knows what it will turn up? Now let's get back to Super Saturn. The star that Super Saturn orbits is J1407, a small, dim, sun-like pre-main sequence star of the 13th magnitude. Huh? Well, the human eye can only see stars to about the 6th magnitude, and each magnitude is 2.5 times dimmer than the previous one. So it's not an exceptional star, just another telescopic star out there in the Scorpius Centaur region of the night sky. J1407 is a young star that hasn't yet settled into its stable, long-duration phase. This is important because Super Saturn, officially J1407b, is showing signs of having a ring system in an early stage of development. Super Saturn's light curve was tucked away in the mountain of data from the Super Wasp project. Professor Eric Mamajak and his associate, Matthew Kenworthy of Leicester University, studied the data thoroughly and produced a detailed report on it. Knowledge depends on good data. The horizontal axis of J1407b's light curve, the time axis, is what's causing all the hubbub. It took Super Saturn weeks to transit across in front of its parent star. 56 days, to be exact. Planetary ring systems that we are familiar with in our solar system orbit right around the equators of the gas giant planets and are very thin, from only a few meters thick down to a few centimeters. In a telescope, Saturn's rings will seem to disappear when the planet is at zero inclination toward Earth. Saturn must be inclined at an angle in relation to Earth to see Saturn's beautiful ring system. It's something everyone should make a point of seeing – Saturn in a telescope. If Super Saturn's rings block most of the light from J1407 for 56 days, it means that the planet had to be orbiting at a steep inclination to its star. If it were at zero inclination, we wouldn't see the rings blocking any light. Therefore, the orbital time could be determined – 10 years minimum to 200 years if the orbit is highly elliptical. The superplanet itself is calculated to be 24 times the mass of Jupiter, which means that if it is gaseous, it could be a brown dwarf star. Super Saturn appears to have a Mars-sized object orbiting around it, because there is a huge gap in the rings that was most probably cleared out by a large object. The Cassini division in the rings of Saturn is where the moon Mimas has cleared out a path through Saturn's rings. The light curve of Super Saturn has only been observed once. All the exoplanet detection systems are keeping an eye out for it to come back around J1407. No one knows when that will occur. Some astronomers have suggested that J1407b is a brown dwarf star system in itself, merely passing in front of, but not connected to, star J1407. An orbital reappearance of Super Saturn would disprove that conjecture. The center region of Super Saturn blocked out all the light from its primary star. This is what indicates that the ring system is new and in an early developmental phase. Over time, the very dense ring mass close to the planet is expected to thin as all this matter gets absorbed into the planet or ejected into space. This is what has happened with our solar system's gas giant planets. The Mamajek object is a shocker. Never before or since has a light curve been detected like Super Saturn's. Super Saturn has added a new chapter to our understanding of the formation of ring systems. So, here's to you, Super Saturn. Hope to see you again soon. Mercury gets a bad rap for always being hot, but that's not entirely true. The planet's got no atmosphere, so its temperature swings are wild. When it's facing the sun, it can get up to a blistering 800 degree Fahrenheit, but when it's turned away, it drops to a frigid minus 290 degrees. The reason for this is that Earth has a cozy atmosphere that keeps our temps in check. Mercury doesn't have that luxury, 
so it's at the mercy of the sun's rays. But despite all that, Mercury's still worth checking out. It's close to the sun, which makes it a prime spot for studying how solar radiation affects planets. And even though it's not exactly hospitable to life, there are still plenty of mysteries to unravel. Venus is often referred to as the sister planet of Earth. Yeah, many people believe that it's this beautiful and lush planet, just like our home. But boy are they wrong, in reality Venus is a total diva. She's got this thick atmosphere that traps heat and causes surface temperatures to reach up to a scorching 864 degree Fahrenheit. I mean, I get it. Venus wants to stand out and be unique, but she's taken it to a whole new level. She's like that one friend who always has to one-up everyone else. Oh, you think Earth is cool? Well, I'm the only planet that spins clockwise. Beat that. But let's be real here. Venus is just trying too hard. She's got these crazy sulfuric acid clouds that rain down on her surface and make it impossible for anything to survive. It's like she's trying to keep all the attention for herself by making sure no other life forms can exist. And her atmosphere, it's so thick and heavy that it would crush us like a grape. So, yeah, Venus may look pretty from afar with her bright yellowish glow, but don't fall for that. She's a total drama queen who just can't handle sharing the spotlight with anyone else. Anyway, enough about Venus. Let's focus on the real star of the show, Earth. We may not have all the flashy features that Venus has, but at least we're hospitable and welcoming to all forms of life. Plus, we've got pizza. So who needs sulfuric acid clouds anyway? You may think that since we live on this planet, we know it from A to Z, and there is no room for any misconception. Alrighty, then tell me what shape is Earth? If you say it's round, sorry, but you're not right. So, our planet may look like a ball, but it isn't a perfect one. You see, because of the spinning action, the North and South Poles get squished a bit and they're sort of flat. The Earth's wobbling, and other stuff are actually causing it to change shape over time, but it's still roundish. Let's talk about Mars, the red planet that has fascinated humans for centuries. Now I know we all have this idea that Mars is this habitable planet that we can just pack our bags and move to if Earth becomes uninhabitable. Nope, that's not entirely true. One common misconception about Mars is that it has a breathable atmosphere. While Mars does have an atmosphere, it is much thinner than Earth's and consists mostly of carbon dioxide, making it unsuitable for human life without extensive life support systems. So if you're planning on taking a stroll on the surface of Mars, you better pack your oxygen tanks. But hey, that doesn't mean we should give up on our dreams of colonizing Mars. Who knows? Maybe in a few decades, we'll be able to call Mars our second home. Some people think Jupiter is a solid planet, but let me tell you, that's just a bunch of hot air. Literally. Jupiter is actually a gas giant made up mostly of hydrogen and helium. It's so massive that it doesn't even have a solid surface. I mean, I thought my bed was soft, but floating on a cloud of gas sounds pretty comfy too. Jupiter's atmosphere gradually transitions into its interior, which means it's like a never-ending party in there. Saturn's rings are one of the most fascinating features of the planet. So, a common misconception about Saturn is that its rings are solid. In reality, Saturn's rings are made up of countless small particles of ice and rock that orbit the planet. They stretch out over 174,000 miles from the planet's surface, but are only about 65 feet thick. The particles that make up the rings range in size from tiny specks of dust to large boulders. Scientists believe that the rings were formed from debris left over after the formation of Saturn and its moons. Over time, the particles were pulled in by Saturn's gravity and formed into the beautiful rings we see today. Saturn's rings also have some amazing features, such as gaps and divisions caused by the gravitational pull of nearby moons. There are also waves and spiral patterns that are created by the gravitational interactions between the particles in the rings. Despite their beauty, Saturn's rings are constantly changing. The particles collide with each other, creating new ones and breaking apart others. This means that the rings we see today may look very different in the future. So next time you look up at Saturn and its rings, Remember that you're looking at a cosmic snow globe made up of billions of tiny particles floating around the planet. 
Now, one common misconception about Uranus is that it's a lazy dude who can't even rotate properly. People think it just rolls around on its side all day long, but let me tell you, that's not entirely true. Sure, Uranus does have a tilted axis of rotation, but it still manages to spin in the same direction as most other planets in our solar system. It's like that one friend who always shows up late to the party, but still manages to have a good time and fit in with the crowd. But let's be real, Uranus is still a bit of an oddball. It's the only planet in our solar system that rotates on its side to such a degree. But after all, variety is the spice of life, right? So cheers to Uranus, the planet that refuses to conform to anyone's expectations. Ugh, I wish I had the guts to be like this. Have you ever heard someone say that Neptune is just a blue version of Jupiter or Saturn? Well, let me tell you, that's like saying a banana is just a yellow version of a cucumber. It's not even close. Sure, Neptune and its gas giant buddies share some similarities, but Neptune stands out in the crowd with its beautiful blue hue. It's all thanks to the methane chilling in its atmosphere. By the way, did you know that it's the farthest planet from the Sun? It's so far out there that it takes almost 165 Earth years for it to complete one orbit around the Sun. Talk about taking your sweet time. And let's not forget about its 14 moons. That's right, Neptune has a whole entourage of moons following it around like groupies at a concert. Maybe they're hoping to catch a glimpse of Neptune's famous blue glow. So, next time someone tries to tell you that Neptune is just a knockoff version of Jupiter or Saturn, you can confidently correct them and say, excuse me, but Neptune is its own unique gas giant with a fancy blue vibe. Did you know that Pluto isn't actually considered a planet anymore? That's right, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union decided to reclassify Pluto as a dwarf planet. So what exactly does that mean? Well, a dwarf planet is a celestial body that orbits the Sun and is big enough to be rounded by its own gravity. But it hasn't cleared its orbit of other debris. It's a common misconception that Pluto is still considered a planet. But the truth is that it's just not big enough to make the cut. Sorry, Pluto. Don't worry, though. You may be small, but you're still loved by many. Plus, being a dwarf planet is pretty cool, too. You get to hang out with other celestial misfits like Ceres and Haumea. So keep on orbiting, Pluto. We still think you're out of this world. Now tell me, what's the scariest thing in the universe? What, besides Darth Vader and a lightsaber? Well, actually, I was asking about black holes, swallowing anything that comes too close without doubts or regrets. Blinding supernovae, mysterious hypothetical wormholes. Yeah, probably not. Because the most terrifying things in the universe are likely to be rogue planets. Ooh. Nomads, orphans, sunless, unbound. That is what these creepy worlds are called. They have no sun. Unwanted in their star systems, they were once ejected into the soulless emptiness of space. And some of them didn't even have their own star systems. They were born lonely. Rogue planets don't have sunlight. The never-ending night rains on their surfaces. No light means no warmth, and almost no chance of any kind of life to be able to survive in these frozen worlds. <laughs> how lonely! Kind of makes you tear up a little. Okay, I'm done. <clears throat> but how do rogue planets get born? When planetary systems, including our solar system, form, it can get messy. Most planets appear from the cosmic dust that is floating in space around a newborn star. And when these planets form, they push one another. This gravitational game of tag often shoves some planets toward the edges of the newly formed star system. And sometimes, one or two of them get ejected from their home altogether. There are also nearby stars that can play with planets, too. Stars aren't often born on their own. Clusters of dozens to thousands of stars can appear in space. And in such a crowded environment, it's not a rare occurrence when a star with its own planets steals away a planet or two from another star. After getting a new planet, it can keep it for itself or throw it away into the dark, deep cosmos. Some free-floating planets pop up in a different way, with no parent star to help them. Like stars, they form from collapsed clouds of gas and dust. But since they are too weak, they can't put on enough weight and can't start nuclear reactions that make stars emit light. Such planet-like objects are known as failed stars. Or planets can go rogue after their parent stars disappear. 
Yes, sometimes stars go out, destroying some of their planets in the process. At the same time, the most distant ones, located in a safer zone, are left more or less intact. But the enormous force of a supernova ejects these planets away from the former star at a tremendous velocity. In any case, astronomers think there may be more rogue planets in our home Milky Way galaxy than anyone ever suspected. A recent simulation has shown there might be billions of them. But the problem is rogue planets are very hard to detect. You know, it's a tricky feat to find any exoplanet, even when it belongs to a planetary system. After all, planets don't give off their own light like stars. That's why when astronomers want to locate an exoplanet, they look for something blocking the light of its parent star. And it's usually the very planet passing between the star and the observer. But researchers can't use the same technique with free-floating planets because there's no parent star and thus there's no light to get dimmer. Another method of detecting exoplanets is the radial velocity method. It detects the planet's gravitational effect on its parent star. But as you may guess, it doesn't work with rogue planets either. Luckily, there are still some ways we can detect these space wanderers. Imagine a line of sight between a telescope on Earth and a distant star. When an object crosses that line, its presence is likely to bend and magnify the light of the star. This makes it appear brighter than usual. The trickiest part is to figure out whether this object is a rogue planet. It's true that the stars whose light such celestial bodies bend can't be their parent stars. They're too far away. But there might still be a small parent star invisible because of the glare of the main star. And astronomers have to wait for a long time, sometimes up to a decade, for the main star to move a bit. Then they can finally check if there's also a parent star out there. If there's no parent star in sight, then it's proven. The planet is traveling solo. Not apparently. <laughs> so far, astronomers have identified at least 70 rogue planets or candidate rogue planets. At the same time, we know about more than 5,000 exoplanets in planetary systems. That's a huge gap that proves that detecting rogue planets is a tricky business. Interestingly, free-floating planets might not be as lonesome as we think. They can potentially have moons of their own. They might even take them along when they get pushed out of their cosmic homes. But could a free-roaming world, and possibly its moons, find a new home near a different star? Some experts think it's unlikely. The universe is a very spacious place. And even a large star with an incredible gravitational pull is hardly able to catch a fast-moving planet. For example, in 2017, an interstellar guest, an asteroid the size of a skyscraper, appeared in our solar system. It barreled through the solar system and just kept going without stopping or even slowing down. Now let's have a look at a rogue planet we have managed to spot. Just 20 light years away from the Sun, a bizarre rogue planet is roaming the Milky Way galaxy. And even though this planet doesn't orbit any star, it still has an incredibly powerful magnetic field, 4 million times stronger than that of our Earth. The exoplanet, with this crazy long name, also produces amazing auroras. When it was discovered a few years ago, astronomers were almost sure they had detected a brown dwarf. This is an object too large to be a planet and too small to be a star. But later, scientists got some evidence that the space object wasn't big enough to be a brown dwarf. The planet sure is a mammoth among its peers. It's 1.2 times as wide as the largest planet of the solar system, Jupiter, and more than 12 times as heavy. Astronomers think the exceptionally strong magnetic field helps the planet produce such auroras. But the most curious thing is that they're generated in a different way than auroras on Earth. It might be because the exoplanet's moon helps the planet create these light shows. To find more amazing rogue planets, NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is going to conduct a survey using the powerful techniques of a wide-field telescope. The stars in our Milky Way galaxy move all the time and chance adjustments of the telescope can help researchers spot rogue planets. But there's one drawback. We won't know the distance to such a planet even if we find one. There's one more mission concept called CLEOPATRA, the clever NASA acronym for the Contemporaneous Lensing Parallax 
an autonomous transient essay. See, I told you it was clever. It might be able to exploit parallax effects to calculate the distances to rogue planets. Parallax is a shift in the position of a foreground object when seen by observers in slightly different locations. Could Earth one day turn into a frozen sphere aimlessly floating through space? Mm, unlikely. Since our Sun isn't going to blow up one day, our world isn't likely to be pushed out of the solar system by our star going supernova. But a rogue planet could cause life on Earth to end. Oh boy. One day, such a space intruder might push Earth out of the habitable zone near the Sun and take its place. And our planet would have to retreat to an extreme orbit farther from the Sun. The climate all over the planet would start getting colder and colder, turning first half of the planet, then our entire world, into an icy desert. There would be a lack of food and other resources. It'd be getting darker and darker. There wouldn't be enough light for planets to get energy. They would wither, and animals that used to feed on them wouldn't be able to find food. Most species would go extinct. The farther our planet would be from the Sun, the weaker the star's gravitational pull on our planet would be. In the end, our beautiful Earth would get too far away from its main source of light and heat. It would turn into a lifeless piece of rock covered with a thick layer of ice. Wow, bummer. But hey, don't worry, I guarantee that will never happen. At least, not on my watch. On my watch. The sun's heat is beneath our feet. Scientists have figured out that Earth's core is actually as hot as the surface of the sun, around 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the reasons it's so incredibly hot down there is because Earth is still shedding heat from when it was created billions of years ago. Also, when an object as big as Mars slammed into the young Earth, it not only created the moon, according to one theory, but melted the surface of the planet. A lot of that extra heat is probably still stored inside the core. But there's no need to worry. The planet's core is harder for us to access than it is to probe the surface of Pluto. In fact, chances are we may never develop technology that could physically reach the core. There's no air on the moon. But then, how can it be rusting? Scientists have discovered the presence of hermatite on the moon, and it's a kind of rust. A special NASA research instrument examined the light reflected off the moon's surface. It turned out that the composition of the satellite's poles was very different from the rest of it. The moon's surface is dotted with iron-rich rocks. But without oxygen and liquid water, rust can't appear. Solar winds add to the mystery. They bombard the moon with hydrogen. And hydrogen makes it much more difficult for hematite to form. Even though the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it still has some trace amounts of oxygen. Its source is our planet's upper atmosphere. Earth also protects the moon from almost 100% of solar winds, although not all the time. And even though our natural satellite is bone dry, there might be water ice in the shadowed craters on its far side. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds, but Get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Mars's gravitational forces will tear Phobos apart, and it will likely result in the formation of a ring around the planet. The Earth is the densest in the solar system, At the Earth's center, there's a core that takes up 15% of the planet's volume. It consists of two parts, the outer and the inner core. The inner core is a solid ball made of iron and nickel. Its radius is 760 miles, which makes 20% of the entire Earth's radius and 80% of the Moon's radius. The 1,500-mile-thick outer core is liquid. It also consists of iron and nickel but it's not under enough pressure to be solid. Mars houses the biggest volcano in the solar system. While everything seems to be calm on Mars nowadays, 
In the past, some sort of force caused enormous volcanoes to form and erupt. One of these volcanoes is Olympus Mons. It's 16 miles tall, which is the height of three Mount Everests and 374 miles across, making it about the size of Arizona. The volcano grew to such a gargantuan size because of the weak gravity on Mars and the lack of tectonic plate movement. Gravity is not the same everywhere. The rocks, metals, and other minerals and substances that make up the planet are packed into the ground more tightly in certain places than in others. This has surprising consequences. Gravity varies slightly depending on where you are. You weigh 0.5% less standing at the equator than you do at the poles. In most cases, that's a difference of less than one pound. How high up you are also has an effect. So if you were at the top of Mount Everest, you'd also weigh slightly less. Just don't look down. Earth's toughest living thing is so small, you can't see it. Water bears, also known as moss piglets, are cute little creatures with eight legs and squashed up heads that are less than a hundredth of an inch in length. Despite their microscopic stature, they can basically survive anywhere. They prefer bits of wet moss or the bottom of a lake, but they won't complain if you put them somewhere really uncomfortable. They can endure extreme cold and incredible heat and survive both huge pressure and high radiation. Some of the little bears once even managed to survive unprotected in outer space for 10 days without a problem. <laughs> that is tough. They handle all these things by rolling up into a ball and hibernating, which reduces their need for oxygen and food. The moon's gravity is about 17% of that on Earth. If you weighed 200 pounds on our home planet, on the moon, your weight would decrease to a mere 34 pounds. You would also be able to carry stuff six times heavier than what you can carry on Earth. It would also be easier to walk on the moon's surface, but it would be more dangerous too. Your feet, inside a heavy spacesuit, would sink into the lunar soil up to six inches deep. But let's imagine you decided to skip the tedious process of walking by leaping through the air. Then you'd likely lose control of your jumps in no time. Plus, the moon's surface is littered with deep craters. It would be a tough feat to avoid all of them. You can see solar eclipses because even though the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, it's also 400 times closer to Earth. So it's perfectly capable of obscuring the star. But in 50 million years, I won't be around then. The moon won't be able to block the sun completely because of the satellite's changing orbit. A full NASA spacesuit costs an unbelievable $12 million. Yeah, I can believe that. 70% of this hefty sum is for the control module and backpack. At the very center of Uranus, there's a rocky core. Small, just half the Earth's mass. Compared to other planets, Uranus's core is rather cool. 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. An ice mantle surrounds the solid core and that's the largest portion of the planet, about 80%. It's also not the ice you might be thinking about. It's a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia, ice, and methane, sometimes referred to as a water-ammonia ocean. Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, but it has its blue-green color because of methane gas that absorbs the red light. The ocean on Jupiter is larger than any other in the solar system. But unlike Earth's oceans, it's made not of water, but of metallic hydrogen. The ocean's depth is a mind-blowing 25,000 miles. That's almost the same as the distance around Earth. Venus is a champ when it comes to volcanoes. The planet has about 1,600 major ones, but none of them is known to erupt. There's a supermassive black hole 250 million light years away from us. It hums the deepest sound ever detected from any object in the universe. It's 57 octaves lower than the middle C on your piano. That's one quadrillion times deeper than what we can hear. Mercury is a few billion years old. In 2016, Scientists discovered some abnormalities on the planet's surface, showing that it's getting smaller. 
After more research, they found out that Mercury hadn't finished cooling down yet. There are planets that aren't bound to any star orbit and aimlessly wander through outer space. Among the most spectacular looking space objects are pulsars. Pulsars are a type of neutron star. They shoot out some of their material almost at the speed of light. Regular pulsars spin at a reasonable speed, between one-tenth to sixty times per second. But millisecond pulsars can spin at an impressive 700 times a second, which is way too fast for the human eye to even process. As they spin, they emit a beam of radiation from their axis that looks like the light from a lighthouse. Astronomers can notice pulsars when they face Earth, since it looks like a light being shined on our planet. When the light shines elsewhere, the pulsar can't be seen. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. Saturn's rings are very thin compared to its size. If you had a scale model of the planet that was three feet wide, the rings would be 10,000 times thinner than a razor blade. Even though Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, it still has snow, but not what you'd expect. It snows metals and rains acid. Not a great vacation spot. 